Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I grew up in a little Big Ten college town in, in Iowa, Iowa City, and when I grew up there in the 50s, it was... Uh, uh, there were about uh, 25,000 uh, permanent residents and uh, 25,000 at the university or a few more. And uh, it, was a, it was a classic little small town, college town life, and everybody knew everybody else. And I've, uh, I really panicked when I saw forgiveness there because uh, on, the, on the program because I don't have much of, if anything at all, to ever forgive those people for. If, if, if anything, uh, I'm sad that I failed to be awake and listen and appreciate, uh, the growing up and the raising that I, that I had. I, I didn't come from a perfect family, but I came from a, what I'll call a functional family. I'm the oldest of four kids. Uh, and the sad thing was that I lived most of my life as if I was an only child. Uh, and when it came time to make amends to those brothers and my sister, it was for because I, their big brother had just sucked the oxygen out of the room. Uh, because the drama, whether it was good or bad, was always about Mike. Oh, Mike's been wounded again. Mike's done this again. Oh, Mike's in trouble again. Give you a little quick snapshot, and then we'll get. I uh, I was a guy who uh, I've always been a power seeker. I uh, I looked for power in the beginning before I found alcohol and other stuff. I I looked for it by pleasing adults and people I thought had power. And uh, so I was a very good student, and I, I worked in the principal's office, and I belonged to all the appropriate organizations and that kind of stuff. And uh, if your parents, uh, somebody would ask me over to your house for dinner, uh, you'd wince a little bit, because as soon as dinner was over, I'd jump up and start clearing the plates from the table and carrying them out in the kitchen, and I'm rinsing them off. And pretty soon your mother turns to you and says, Billy, why can't you be like that nice Lorenz boy? You know, and I I had what I needed. I thought it was a, a hit off that approval crack pipe. <laughs> yeah, drama and approval. Those are my my drugs of choice, Carl. Uh, I. Uh, when I'm 11 years old, I, fi- I, fi- I got a hold of enough alcohol that the miracle happened. And the miracle for me was just exactly what uh, Carl Jung describes in our, our page 27 of our, our basic text where he's talking to Roland Hazard and trying to tell Roland what a spiritual awakening was. Uh, he says, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, ideas and emotions that govern the lives of these men are suddenly cast to one side and a new set of conceptions takes hold. And that's what happened in the household when Mike got enough liquor that he found the miracle. See, everything, I didn't care, with, within weeks, I didn't, now I wasn't out sticking up 7-Elevens, you know, doing B&Es, doing anything dramatic. You can't do that when you're 11 years old. But <laughs> I, by God, don't need your approval anymore. And that just stunned my parents. They thought there'd been a demon possession in our household. You know, that what happened to the honor student? You know, it's all, yeah, get out of my, you're ruining my life. You don't want me to have any fun. You're putting too much pressure on me. No wonder I, I got a drink. You're putting pressure on me. Uh, You want me to show up for class? I mean, you know. So, uh. You know, and I expect that's not unusual. A lot of people will have that reaction. However, it started to manifest. And, and, and I got in touch with this piece because I got here and I was sober for a period of time. And I really believed that there was a period of normal drinking that I'd enjoyed. And it turns out there was just a period without handcuffs and, and consequences, you know. But there was never any normal drinking. Let me tell you what normal drinking looked like for me. 
I'm, uh, I told you I grew up in this little town and, and we know everybody in town and my folks and my dad's a businessman there and my mother's in the bridge club with the president of the university's wife and the police chief's wife and the sheriff's wife and all this. So we know everybody in this town and, uh, I'm about 16 cause I'm just driving at, recently and I'm out with a buddy kind of riding around out in the county with a couple of six packs in the car and we're drinking and we're yucking it up and having a good time and all of a sudden the red light comes on. Well, uh, turns out it's Barney Fife, the, the deputy is gonna, Barney, Barney's gonna pull me over. Now I know Barney, Barney knows me, Barney, every, every, it's, it's all cool, so I pull, this, this was the days before two man patrol cars, so Barney, Barney pulls me over and I turn to my buddy and I said, watch this. So I get out of the car and I'm smiling and I'm waving and I'm walking back toward Barney and he kind of, he's, you know, he isn't smiling but he, he knows who he's got. And all of a sudden as I get parallel with him, I grab him and I slam him down across the hood of his squad car and I take his gun away from him. And then I turned around and I gave it back to him. And he was upset. <laughs> I mean, he was just sputtering, you know. And I've always, you know, my four-year-old told me once, you know, that I'm always, I'm a little smart, too smart for my own good. You know, he says, Mike, you'll do a lot better if you'd probably start doing the second thing that comes to your mind instead of the first. But I, uh, what happened is Barney yelled at me and screamed at me and gave me a lecture and poured the beer out. But at the end of the day, he turned me loose. Because I had it figured out. There's no way Barney's going to write me up, take me in, and have to listen to his buddies at the sheriff's department razz him for the rest of his career about the kid that took his gun away. Not going to happen. And the most important part of that deal was that my buddy is looking out the back window of that car with big bug eyes watching this all go on. And he runs back to my high school and he's all over telling about Lorenz taking the cop's gun away the next day and I get a, I get a little, you know, I can walk down the hall at my school. I'm, I'm, I'm somebody, you know, in my mind. And I needed to be somebody. And, uh, then the last piece of normal drinking I'll tell you about, uh, was about a year later we, <laughs> We, we, we had another tragedy at the Lorenz household. Uh, I'd been lobbying my dad for a new Corvette for a period of time because I, you know, I need to be somebody, so I needed a Corvette. And, uh, instead of buying me the Corvette that I was entitled to, he actually bought my mother a new car. If you can imagine such a thing. And, to add insult to injury, he bought her the lamest possible thing you could think of. He bought her a four-door Buick hardtop with that kind of ARP senior citizen tan color, you know, uh, that, that you see putting along, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm mortified. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sincerely outraged. Uh, now, now, my mother, if she had been able to keep drinking. She could have been one of us, I think, but she was just kind of normally my my uh, confidant and competitor, uh, confederate. And so eventually, after a couple of weeks, she decides that, uh, you know, she's going to give me her new car for a date. And so I take the car out, and I don't remember about the date, but what happened was after I got through with the date, met up with the guys later that night, and we're, we're having a few drinks, and it's going on, and I end up down at sometime after midnight at uh, my buddy Jerry's da dad owns a machine shop. And so we're down at Buck's machine shop, and one of my friends, we all got to have friends like this, is razzing me about this car, and then he lights a fires up a cutting torch and puts the torch in my hand 
and I get the brilliant idea, well, I may not have a Corvette, but at least I can have a convertible. So I proceed to cut the top off mom's new car. Now, now we fast forward to Sunday morning at the Lorenz house. Uh, my parents bring the younger kids. They're going to take them to church, and they come out in the garage, and here's the smoking hulk of mom's car uh, with big brother laid out naked across the front seat. And I, I'll... I, all I can remember really is my mother screaming, Art, don't hit him, don't hit him. Uh, <laughs> and so that was my normal drinking period. Uh, got, uh, got sober by a series of miracles that, that we've all had in our own ways and, and got here and, uh, once I once I finally caught hold here in Alcoholics Anonymous, I uh, I found I, I love I loved AA, uh, and I did what I what I'd never done before. I, I became an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous, or what I thought an active member was. I'm going to 11 meetings a week. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm grabbing a hold of every service position I can, I can get to it. And this is not 90 meetings in 90 days. This is year after year after year. Uh, and, uh, I, uh, love all this stuff. Oh, I even started my own meeting. Uh, this is my junior guru phase. And if you're going to be a junior guru, you've got to have your own meeting. Uh, <laughs> Because chances are there are meetings where they're just not doing it correctly. And, you know. So, uh, and I get a, I get a new, I crashed and burned badly, but I get a new career and I, and I, and I, I meet and marry a beautiful woman and she, she's got a year and a half year old son, and so I'm, I'm, I'm instant dad, and we're back, I'm back living on the cul-de-sac. It all looks good. Sponsoring people, uh, but as my fifth anniversary in Alcoholics Anonymous approaches, uh, I'm considering suicide with a sincerity I never had when I was drinking. I'm more hopeless and more broken five years away from a drink than I ever was when I was drinking. Uh, and my experience was, see, when I was drinking, uh, there was always the hope that someday I might get sober and the pain might stop and the, and the things that were driving the demons might go away and, and so forth. And if you'd listen to everybody talk, it sounded like drinking was my problem. You know, I, how many people would said to me over the years, Mike, if you just didn't drink, you know, uh, we'd promote you in this company. If you just didn't drink, I'd keep this engagement ring. If you just didn't drink, you know, whatever you want to you want to call it. I haven't had a drink for five years. I've been given given gifts. I, I'm I'm going to lots and lots of AA meetings. And I don't know it, but I'm dying from untreated alcoholism, sitting right, going to 11 meetings a week, and slinging slogans around AA. Uh, there's a gal back home that likes to remind me that she she was a few years she is a few years in front of me, and she was uh, she was a young divorcee with four children, and her crazy husband that I allegedly sponsored came came by drunk with a shotgun and terrorized her and the kids and my my suggestion to her was she needed to do more service work really really uh, but that's all I have and I love AA and my friends are here but my secret when I'm sitting in the room is this works for you 
Because I can see you're changed and I can see you're happy and I can see that your, your, your lives are going differently. But I feel like I'm full of broken glass. See, if that wife I love, she's telling me things like, Mike, being married to you is the loneliest thing I've ever tried to do. Mike, do you suppose if I let you sponsor me that we could have one of those intimate conversations you have with those guys you sponsor? I know more about what you think, feel, and believe by listening to your half of those conversations than from anything you'll tell me. And God's got a sense of humor because in the, in the midst of all of this, uh, well, your, your speaker tomorrow, one of them, uh, was the guy I dislike most in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and I disliked him. I began disliking him, first of all, because my married girlfriend thought he was cute. And <laughs> that, that'll do it every time. Uh, and uh, yeah, gosh, the first time I met Gary, uh, I was getting a 90-day chip, and he was getting a 21-year token. And everybody went, oh, God, he's gorgeous. Oh, he's so tall. He looks like the Marlboro Man. You know, and, yeah, you know. Uh, <laughs> and so... Turns out later Don tells me, you know, if all you've got is resentment and a bad attitude, God can work with that. So there was this Sunday, Sunday morning fancy speaker meeting, uh, that I would go to and I, being a junior guru, I had one of the, I didn't have the front center table, but I had one of the front tables at this thing and it was with tablecloths and china and all this kind of stuff and I'm sitting there with my sink offense, and I find out too late this guy I'm gonna, I hate is gonna talk at this meeting. And, see, my ego trapped me in that chair. If I'd had my, I wanted everything in me wanted to stomp out of that room and not listen to a damn thing that this guy had to say. But I was afraid that somebody, if they saw me leave split before the talk, would think there was something wrong with me. And you can't think there's anything wrong with me. So I, I sat and I listened to the talk from the guy I didn't like. And the fast-forward version of this is that he said some things about his recovery and his experience with this that I knew for a fact were lies. They couldn't be true. And so being a spiritual giant, he mentioned where his home group was, and it was way out of my way, about a 30-mile drive around town. Uh, but being spiritual, I decided that I was going to track him down to his home group and expose him as a phony and liar and see if I could <laughs> see if I could run him out of AA. <laughs> so I, I I showed up at my current home group. Uh, <laughs> With this agenda, and, and Gary meets me at the door and welcomes me, and I go in, and I sit through the meeting. Anyway, I never got the goods on him. I mean, I don't know why he, you know, he kept up a good front. And I was leaving this place never to return again, you know. I don't need this kind of stuff. And just as I'm leaving, he grabs me and he says, Hey, Mike, I'm supposed to chair next week, but I may have a business commitment that will keep me from being here. Would you be willing to fill in for me? Well, I'll come back to run your group, you know. (laughs) (laughs) So once again, ego snagged when I came back there. And I, I, further from a drink than I ever imagined I could be, I, I got to have a have a finally have an experience with Alcoholics Anonymous. What happened to me was uh, a great deal like when I'd gone to the university years before. I went over the field house, registered for all my classes, bought my books, joined a fraternity, threw the books in the closet, and started to party. And if you asked me what I was doing there on campus, I'd say, well, I'm a pre-law student here at the University of Iowa, sir. Well, that's technically true, except I'm like Carl. I'm rarely in class. And uh, 
That's what I'd done in AA. I'd, I'd never missed a meeting. I never missed a dance. I didn't miss a service commitment. I just missed the program. <laughs> now that didn't that didn't keep me from talking about the program, as you you know. I, I would I would tell you you need to turn that over now. <laughs> now. If, if you'd asked me how the hell I was going to go about doing that, I wouldn't have had a clue. You know, I, well, I think there's some kind of prayer you say, do that, you know. So, uh, turns out, uh, yeah, spiritual principles. I got here, now this was before I got married, but what my early sober time in AA, uh, I'm having a conversation with my sponsor number two in the parking lot of the the local AA club, and uh, I'm uh, <laughs> George is releasing me with love at this time, and and the reason is that uh, I'm as I explained to you I'm dating a married woman in the program, I'm sponsoring her 16 year old son, and I play cards on the weekend with her husband and he's a gun toting federal agent, <laughs> and. And George says, Mike, you know, every time I can confront you about your behavior, you explain it to me in such a way that I start to think it might be God's will. He says, I, <laughs> he says, I know that's insane, so I can't have anything to do with you. <laughs> so this is what sober Mike looks like. And uh, Gary, Gary and the guys got a hold of me, and I... I, I had my first real experience. And it was unfortunately not in time to, uh, to have uh, to save that marriage. Uh, by the way, if you're trying to save a marriage, don't do something like go home and tell your wife who's eight months sober longer than you are that you're going to have step study school for her at the kitchen table at your house. Uh, that, that That is not a good move. Uh, <laughs> So, spiritual principles here. It turns, it turns out, here's what, I'll, uh, I'll share with you something. This is, this is how I started to connect in a concrete way. And, uh, now, with the proviso that Katie's gonna tell you how to do this very correctly in the morning. Uh, this this is a very imperfect effort. I'm I'm here and I survived as a result of lots of very imperfect efforts in AA. Uh, one of the, one of the things that Don told me he says the only time you need to do something perfectly in AA is if you've taken the position that you're only going to do it once. If you're going to do it once, then it better be perfect. But if you're willing to repeat as necessary, uh, then. Uh, then you need no ha- have no fear about maybe not correctly, quite correctly doing it, because you'll life is generous and you'll have another t- chance. So, uh, a guy that I'd met along the way uh, had, had I was calling him and calling him and trying to get him uh, some insight and stuff from my, I don't know what. St- I'm a spiritual thief, turns out. Yeah, I. Uh, I laid that line on on Don once. Don, I want what you have. He says, you can't have it. <laughs> what? He says, he says you can, what I've got is mine. He says, I'll show you how to get yours, but you can't have mine. And by the way, why would you want it? So I'm trying to get something from from Mickey, and uh, I keep calling him and calling. Finally, he says, "Look, Mike, I've told you I want you to do this piece of inventory. If you're not willing to do it, don't call me back until you've done it." Click. So I, I wrote the piece of inventory I didn't want to write, uh, and like I did so often, I, I'm, I'm, I put myself in this position because I've way overthought this whole thing. See, what he wanted to me to write about was all the ways I hated myself. And that sounded way too new agey. And besides that, I knew that if I put myself in column one there, I was going to get taken to a place 
where I might have to make amends to myself. And I don't want to be like that guy that I see in the noon meeting, you know, the half measures meeting there. He's, he's in there talking about, oh, I think I hurt myself more than anybody else. And <laughs> instead of paying my back child support, I bought a Porsche for my inner child, you know. Uh, <laughs> see, this is, this is the way my ego will keep me away from life saving stuff. And, and so anyway, I, uh, I'm, I won't. This is boring stuff, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you just a, a, a little little taste of what rolled off here. Uh, uh, I resent Mike uh, because I'm uh, unable to be a true friend. I gossip. I only pretend to care about you. My mind's only f- always focused on me. And by the way, watch your wife or girlfriend around me. Hmm. Affects my self-esteem because I don't respect my own behavior. Imagine that. Uh, security's lacking because I either assume other people are like me and don't really care, or they're better than I am because they do. I built myself a box there. Uh, <coughs> affects my personal sex relation because I'm always looking for my own pleasure and trying to manipulate other people for my own benefit. Even the good things I do are done to impress others or benefit me and manage and control how others see me. My mistakes. Well, I'm unwilling to trust God. I want to be important, the center of attention, full of ego. Uh, And I find an old idea here. Why am I interested in your wife or girlfriend? Well, if I can... The old idea here is if I can be loved by somebody you want, I can steal a little self-worth, you know. Uh, if you're married to her or you're dating her, uh, she's already pre-approved, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a given. She's, she's a good deal. No. That's, uh, there's, there were pages and pages of, of junk like that, and there isn't any particular marvelous insight in all of that. But what happens, see, I come from a tradition uh, where we, uh, when we write inventory, uh, we tend to share it with more than one person. So I, I shared it with the guy that made me write it. And, you know, it was sort of, okay, I, I got around finally, I'm sharing it with another, I'm sharing it with Don, and, and I went after page and page after that. And he changed my life. He said, Mike, every one of those fourth columns, I hear someone in there unwilling or unable to trust God, unwilling or unable to trust God. It's there all over this thing. Its fingerprints are all over it. And he says, I believe you're a man who'd very much like to trust God. So if you're not able to trust God, there must be something blocking you. Let's see if we can find out what that is. And so what happened, uh, he sent me into consideration with that and I, where I came back, came out is I'm a 21, 22 years old. I'm sitting at the kitchen table. I'm back from Vietnam. Uh, I've, uh, I'm a highly decorated guy in my part of the country and, and all that kind of stuff. And my dad, my, the guy who's my hero, is sitting across that kitchen table from me. And he's not angry. He's got tears in his eyes. And he's looking at me and he says, Son, he says, I love you more than anything I can even begin to tell you about. And he says, I'd do anything to help you, but it seems like the more I do for you, the worse you screw up. What am I going to do with you? And given what I'd been doing, I mean, he... He's got a pile of my bad checks there. He had to go around to his friends and fellow businessmen and buy his big kids' bad checks back and, and all that stuff. Of course, I, I've broken his heart time and time again. I terrified him when I was in the war. And I've broken this strong man that's my hero. And so what I'd done with that, I was, I'm operating at this time from the conception of God the Father. See, what I've done is I've transferred my father's perfectly appropriate reaction to my behavior over... I hear God telling me, look at all I've done for you, Mike. 
I've given you careers. I've given you an education. I've given you relationships. I've given you a marriage. I've, I've given you money. I've given you everything, and you keep screwing up. What am I going to do with you? See, what was a perfectly appropriate response from my human father was a death sentence when I, when I put that on, on the God of my understanding. And I didn't even know that was there until that man helped me find it. Uh, and then uh, get into the part that really started the change. Uh, we got to find something or somebody where I can begin to have a relationship. I, I had a, a good friend by the name of Clint, and Clint, Clint would always harp on the fact that he says, Mike, you don't need to believe in God, you need to have a relationship with God. And his example, he says, you know, that in your inventory, that, that cheerleader, Becky, that you were all excited about, he says, now, did you, what, did you need to believe in Becky or did you need to have a little something more going on with Becky? I mean, was just believing in Becky going to be get the job done? And he says, if it's that way with Becky, then it's probably that way, you know, in this relationship. And so I come up out of this after some a period of consideration and reflection with what I call my my four pillars that I that I started to uh, uh, assemble a spiritual life on and the first the first characteristic that uh, that higher power had to have for me was God's not angry uh, I don't know about you but I will not be close and open and intimate with anybody that I believe is angry with me. I'm never going to be good enough. I'm never quite making the grade. It's, it, there's, there's always a chip in the china, all this kind of stuff just for me. Uh, see, I was treating God like the IRS. I got to do business with him, but I'm not going to get any closer or spend any more time than I got to. You know. So God's not angry. That's the anchor point. And then, uh, the next piece was that uh, God doesn't think comparatively. God loved me just as much when I'm standing in a liquor store writing a bad check to buy a bottle of whiskey to go seduce the neighbor's wife as he does when I'm at the Salvation Army trying to help a newcomer. Now, make no mistakes. I get different consequences depending upon which one of those things I'm doing. But that's not God punishing me. That's just me getting the consequences of my behavior. If I go out and lay down in traffic out here and a car hits me, that is not God punishing me. That is traffic, you know, coming. <laughs> down. And then the next piece was given to me uh, by a priest that was in our home group for a long time who is now past and uh, Larry uh, Larry said you know this is a, an inner city parish here and I get to do a lot of pastoral counseling here and uh, there, it's a rough deal and there's some bad families here and, and so forth but uh, I uh, he says even thank you even the worst parents the roughest parents, the worst parents, when I when I ask them what they want for their kids, they will all tell. They don't tell me they want their kids to be doctors, lawyers, nuclear physicists. They tell, they say they just want their kids to be happy. See, he says, Mike, can you believe that, that if these worst parents can want their kids to be happy, that maybe God might want you to be happy? And I'd never occurred to me in that relationship. So now I'm starting to build something. I got a relation. I got somebody who's not angry that I can show up with. Somebody who's not judging me on an ever failing scale. And now somebody who's interested in my happiness. And he went on quickly to explain that there's a difference between happiness and pleasure, by the way. You know, happy, happiness, there isn't a price to pay for happiness. There's no downside reaction to happiness. 
pleasure if I go out and scarf up a couple pints of Ben and Jerry's. You know, it tastes real good, but I'm going to pay a price for it. Not so with this deal. And then finally, Larry asked me, he says, would you be willing to consider that perhaps it's possible that God might know what would make you happy more than you do yourself? And because these guys had had me do a lot of writing and a lot of consideration, I, I, I looked at those inventories, and, and if you wanted to look at them in a certain way, it's really the story of Mike for 38 years doing everything Mike can do to make Mike happy. My happiness, or my pleasure anyway, was my primary purpose. And I'm sorry if you got in my way. And I understood that I'd failed utterly, and I, I, I couldn't convince myself if God gave me another 38 years that I'd do any better job at making myself happy than I'd done with the first. So now I show up for this relationship. And old ideas are, are interesting things. Well, here. Here, I'll show you what an old idea looks like. This is an old idea. Now, it, it's hard to see from here, but this is, an, uh, this is a picture of a, an attractive young woman. Now, three months ago, approximately, I get a phone call from a family member that says, Mike, uh, and asked me to find a certain picture for him. So I go into the shoe boxes and start looking around, and I, I come out with this picture. And she looks kind of familiar, I mean, you know, and everything, but I, I can't really place her. And I turn it over, and on the back it says, To Mike, with love, from Kathy. And then it's got a date on it. Well, it's a funny thing, but that date is the exact same date that's on my arm. And see, my story was that when I returned from Vietnam and got out of the Army at Oakland Army Terminal and went to fly home from San Francisco, that they were hating on us GIs and they were mean to us and they spit on us and they cursed us and they did all this stuff. And I've lived with this story and I believe this story that, and the story just went poof, it blew up. Because when I'm looking at this, I remember that uh, the real story was that Kathy and I ran into each other at the San Francisco airport. And Kathy adopted me and took me home to her apartment in Oakland for three days to properly welcome me back to the United States. <laughs> now, no cell phones, no emails, so now I've, I've, I know if I... If my mother gets wind that her son is back in the United States, his butt is going to have to be home. And I'm not quite ready to go home yet. I love my mother, but I'm not in that much of a hurry to get home. So what do I do? I make up a story. You know. See, first of all, look at the self-centeredness. I'm willing to let the people that love me dearly... And remember, I've been shot and almost killed a number of times, so... I'm willing to let those people think I'm still in a war zone being shot at so I can be shacked up for the weekend. How selfish and self-centered is that? And I can't tell you that's the way I am, so i got to make up a story. And I told the story so many times, I honest to God, you could have polygraphed me six months ago and I would have told you the truth. I've told Gary the story. I believe that story was true. So whatever your story is, don't hang on to it too tightly. It may just blow up. But my, my experience is when those stories blow up, it's always good news. See, I found out that, that really... Uh, People are far more loving and kind than I ever gave, gave them credit for. Because the story I had was about how, me, how mean they were and how nasty it was. I uh, want to tell you 
Another quick story here, and then we'll, uh, I'll be out of time, but as, as a result of writing an, another piece of inventory, uh, I, uh, well, I'll read it. It's, I'm, I'm trying to think of it. This may be the short way to t- tell this thing. Uh, okay. I, uh, I get in a, a major self-pity attack. Uh, Mike, I couldn't save my marriage, but now I'm a great three, three-day-a-week parent uh, to that marvelous uh, young boy I was telling you about. And Andrew's a lot of fun. Uh, he, uh, he comes, he's six years old by this time, by the time the divorce comes about. And so he says, uh, comes up to me, Mike, and he says, Mike, he says, I'm tired of going to these kids' places. I want you to take me to a real restaurant tonight. No McDonald's playground, no Arby's, no, you know, Applebee's, any of that stuff. It's so a real restaurant. I want cloth napkins. And, <laughs> yeah, it's six years old. Well, hey, I, I didn't have a clue as to how to be a dad. And I, I asked uh, Lori, my wife, I says, Lori, you know, what, what's going on? She says, you know, if you pay attention to him, he'll show you what to do. Hmm, what a concept. And sure enough, not long after we had that concept, uh, Andrew and I were riding home from daycare, and he turns to me and he says, you know, Mike, he says, I got lots of friends. He says, I need you to be my dad. And I got my job description. I don't need to be your buddy, your pal, or anything else. We have those moments. But anyway, so we're in this restaurant, and it's Friday night, and the lights are kind of dim and everything else, and I'm having a good time. Kids, good company. And all of a sudden, I look up and I look around this restaurant, and my God, it's full of couples in love, and I'm sitting here with a six-year-old. And look what God has done to me. And the self-pity tsunami just washes over me. I mean, the tragedy of Mike's life being... Stuck here with the six-year-old. So you've, you've, you've got me trained by now. So we finish our dinner. We go home. We watch a video. Uh, you know, he gets his shower and we put him to bed and we have a little bedtime story. But as soon as he's out, I'm at the kitchen table and I'm writing inventory and I am mad and I am mad at God. So this is what it sounds like for Mike to be mad at God. <clears throat> uh, well, I'm mad at God. I do, why? Because I don't have the relationship I want to have with a woman. I think that God is only going to give me the choice between having a sick relationship or no relationship. I'm lonely. People with less recovery are ahead of me in this area. People I sponsor are doing better. <laughs> I'm afraid that God will keep me in this pain because I'll be more useful to others than if I have the relationship. (laughs) Unfortunately, it gets worse. (laughs) I feel like God has given me a gift of communicating with others, and the price of the gift is my own happiness. You can't make this shit up. I mean. <laughs> I'm mad because I know that only God can help me, and I don't believe He will. Hmm. Turns out that's a spiritual death sentence, folks. So, well, we get over here to column three. Well, it affects my self-esteem. I feel like I'd sell out my principles to have a comfortable relationship. And for example, I might do something like hitting on a newcomer. Uh, as a result, I feel like a phony. Don said, Mike, that's because you're a phony. <gasps> he was that way with me. I feel so ashamed. You should be. I feel so guilty. You are. That, by the way, is love. That's the real tool we have here is love. See, I would listen to that man because I knew he loved me. And that had to be established before any of the other technical stuff really meant much at all. 
uh, uh, distorts my sex relationship. I'm having an increasingly emotionally unsatisfying sex-only relationship. I decided this is the early 90s. I decided before it was fashionable to out-sex my sex life. And what that looked like was that I found a gal who was not a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, who was like-minded, and the agreement was no cards, no movies, no anniversaries, no any of that stuff. We'll just we no no cell phones then. Well, we just call each other secretaries, and the code word is racquetball. Uh, that we're we're going to make a date to play racquetball. And and this isn't working for me. <laughs> See, it's not my problems that are killing me; it's my solutions. You know, I. You know, of course, Don says now. He says that's wonderful. I said it is. He says yes. He says if you were the kind of guy that could use another human being that way, there wouldn't be any hope for you. But since you can't do that, he says I think there is. And uh, anyway, it keeps me uh, jealous of everybody else and comparing myself to them and unwilling to share my pain. I feel ashamed, apart from flawed and different. My unbalanced drive in this area makes me vulnerable to getting drunk, compromising my principles will get me drunk, and I know I don't have the strength not to do this. Column four, I'm not willing to give this to God because I don't think he's interested or willing to help. I'm willing to sell out all my principles in order to get relief. Uh, and I won't take an honest look at what this... I've, I've got this fantasy that if I just get this thing in place, just get this magic relationship going, everything else lines up. And, uh, and I'm looking for somebody else to fill me up and make me feel safe and secure, and only God can do that. And I pretty quickly, that same night, I called Gary, and I fifth-stepped that with him. And I, I start working my way west across the time zones, and I, I uh, called Don, and, and Don listened to that, and uh, he, uh, he changed my life with a couple of things. He, uh, he said, "Tell me about this magic woman that's going to fix it all." And uh, so I did. I, in exquisite detail, exactly what she was like and personality, everything. He says, Mike, he says, let me ask you this. On the off chance such a woman actually exists, why would she want to have anything to do with you? <laughs> he says, look, it's, it's the fall. He says, look out in the sky tonight. The geese are going to be flying over with the geese. The ducks are going to be flying with the ducks, and there won't be a cow in the middle of either formation. So, you know, he says, if you want, if you want that woman in your life, you have to become somebody that woman would be interested in. Do you really think God's going to go mess with some nice woman's life in order to make yours better? And that's true. Wasn't, isn't that the God we always afraid there was somebody that would use me to help somebody else at my expense? Doesn't work that way. Turns out the, the spiritual ryth- arithmetic, God always to, puts two people together so they both get what they need if they're willing to accept it. And so he gave me a prayer, and uh, the prayer was, I, I kind of blew off. He says, God, the prayer is just this, God, teach me, please teach me about love. And I said, thanks, and I hung up, and I called Clint in L.A. And part of my deal with Don was that if I, set, if I followed his advice and uh, didn't like the results I got, I could call up and complain. So a couple weeks later, I call up, and I say, Don, you need to know I don't think much of your damn prayer. And he says, well, tell me about that, cowboy. And uh, I says, well, since I started saying your prayer, the only woman I was really thought I had a chance that, you know, she might be the one, her company transferred her out of town. And so she's she's out of the game now. And then to put a cherry on top of the whole thing, I went to see my doctor last week. He said, I've got high blood pressure. And he gave me some medication that's made me impotent. 
And Don just laughed. And, and <laughs> he says, you must have understood that prayer. You thought the prayer was God, get me a woman, didn't you? He says, the prayer is God, please teach me about love. Work with me here. He says, Mike, you're a, no, you're a man who knows a lot about sex and knows nothing about love. And so I started, because I knew he loved me. Oh, his other one I will give you. Uh, this would be the dialogue. You know I love you, don't you, Mike? Yes, Don, I believe you love me. Well, knowing that I love you, you know that if there is any way I can tell you how to have a successful sick relationship, I do it, don't you? <laughs> Just, but there, but there isn't, so I can't. Uh, that's a great sp- one to have in your sponsorship toolkit, by the way. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, say it saves a lot of, a lot of torture. Uh, so I start, I start saying the prayer because I, I, because I, I know this man loves me. Not believing in the prayer, but all of a sudden I find out that I'm in love and, and I'm head over heels in love and I'm in love with that kid like I was never in love with him before. Uh, he and his mom were always a little more special with each other, a little tighter and everything else. And, uh, you know, he and I had always gotten along, but blew out and I, I just loved him like a rainbow. And that's been a lot of years and still do to this day. And then, Another strange thing happened. I, I, I fell in love again, and it, it was with my former wife. Uh, now, I didn't want to marry her again. Uh, but, now that's not a laugh line. I didn't want to marry her again, but what I, the best way I can describe it to you is God restored her to the place she had in my heart before all the stuff started happening. Uh, and one of the first things we were able to do together was go to a PTA meeting. Uh, and we're riding in the car home from this PTA meeting. I turned to her and I says, you know, amends had been made and all this stuff by now. And I said, Lori, I says, you know, I think about the only bad feeling I've got left about the divorce is that it interrupted our friendship. And I look over and she's got this big ear to ear grin. She says, you still don't get it, do you? I said, no, what? And she says, Mike, it was the marriage that interrupted our friendship. Uh, And it turns out that we're two people that are really well suited to be each other's good friends. But we're alcoholics, so being married sounded like it was more. So we just picked. And all that happened was God just settled things back to where they were. And they still do. Uh, I, uh, I eventually kept saying the prayer and kept saying the prayer and eventually, uh, she did show up in my life, and uh, I didn't pick her. Uh, and she uh, she was a way too young, way too pretty, you know, all this in in AA. And we she was my kind of like Charlie and Katie a little bit. She was my AA buddy, and uh, she came up to me in a parking lot after we'd done a workshop for some people back home one Saturday and, and says, you know, Mike, you need to know I love you. And I said, well, that's nice. And she says, no, focus. And <laughs> she said, I mean, I really love you. And uh, wow. You know, I just tell you, wow. Now, wow was short-lived, however, because our third date, I showed up over at her place and... Uh, <clears throat> She had a piece of paper in her hand, and she said, Mike, I've, uh, I've written out what I think the primary purpose for our relationship ought to be, and uh, I'd like to see your efforts pretty soon. Uh, and I thought that was way too serious and way too, you know, just... She used to come to the podium, and she'd tell you that uh, her, her uh, ideal for our relationship... Uh, primary purpose was so specific that it specified the color, clarity, and weight of the diamond I was supposed to buy, and that mine was so vague and general that it could have described my relationship with my cat. <laughs> and uh, we uh, we did the dance together because uh, she, like I, uh, had been schooled in this program, and uh, I'll, I'll give you... Uh, 
we carry two things here. Uh, our uh, ideal for our sex conduct and uh, the primary purpose for our relationship here because they're things that we always need to have close at hand, especially when temptation or anger or any anything may arise. Here it says... Uh, the primary purpose will practice the active support of the growth and well-being of each other's spiritual condition. We will honor and express God's love and devotion within our relationships so we may worship and serve God both together and when we're apart. Honor the holiness of marriage, the sanctity of service to others, and the delight of living and loving each other without fear. And then the conduct is for me... I'll try to be the best of lovers by being the best of friends and seeking each day to contribute to rather than take from you in our relationship. My love for you doesn't give me special privileges. It gives me special responsibilities. I will listen to you and to God, and you will teach me how to do that. this if I'm faithful and attentive. And my experience is that... Uh, when we're willing to thoughtfully consider and take such a position, uh, these are prayers that God seems to, to answer and honor. Uh, now that, uh, I thought the prayer turned to ashes because I came back from a trip to Santa Fe and I found Linda didn't meet me at the airport. I found her collapsed in her bathroom, uh, at her house and uh, she'd been there for about 15 hours, and we went to the hospital, and we were in neurointensive care, and this young, beautiful woman uh, died five days later from a hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, and another miracle happened here. I, uh, I got to see this from an entirely different angle. I got to not listen to the voice that was screaming in my head, this isn't fair and all this other kind of stuff. And I just got to be present with her and not lose that whole thing. Uh, And uh, so after that, it turns out the lesson is accepting love from others. And that can be very scary because when I'm giving out the love, I'm deciding what it looks like and how long it's going to last. And when you're giving it out, you're in charge of all those things. What if I'm just leaning into you a little bit and you say enough? Uh, And then I get all these marvelous, keep saying the prayer, keep saying the prayer. And all these beautiful women turn up in my life and it turns out they're my friends without benefits. And I, I I get to have the joy and intimacy and delight and spiritual wholeness of of knowing these women in an entirely different way. And uh, it's really sweet. Uh, I'd like to tell you more about that, but we're way out of time here. I I just want to tell you that uh, I'm, uh, I'm the crazy guy that at closing time at the bar I used to be pounding on the bar and looking in the mirror and screaming or mumbling, you know, it's not fair, it's not fair, God damn it, it's not fair. And I'm here to tell you tonight from the bottom of my heart, thank God it's not fair. Thank God it's not fair. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.